Good morning, YouTubers, subscribers, and friends of the like. It's Grant coming at you. It's November 22nd. Tomorrow is my birthday as of technically tonight at midnight. I turn 38. I'm at the Flying J in Lordsburg, New Mexico, where I've been all weekend. Just kind of killing time because Wilcox, Arizona is colder. It's like 29 degrees at night tomorrow night. And here is 46 degrees at night. So I'm kind of waiting for the cold front through Arizona to pass through before I continue on. Anyway, in the meantime, I had Jim Jones, one of my longtime uh, subscribers, hit me up last yesterday, so I give you a shout out, man. And he asked me to go over some hitchhiking tips, anything and everything I could think of about hitchhiking. I don't know if he or somebody, one friend of his, is wanting to do so in the future. I haven't discussed it, but I thought it's a great time to be able to do that for some kind of video content this weekend as I'm sitting here doing nothing really anyway but kept passing time so I made a list on my other phone and just so I would have the topics to go off of to remind me so to speak because when you get older I've noticed it, the more you need to be reminded <laughs> so let's start into uh, this video is going to be about hitchhiking tips from my logging me some history for the ones that don't know just tune into this video today uh, and I think it was February of last year in 2019 I went to Hawaii and was a beach bum and worked at a coconut shack for a couple months and then since I was on foot for that long that ventured into flying back to the mainland and hitchhiking from uh, LAX in Los Angeles to you know, I use the bus to go to Vegas and then Vegas up to uh, Yellowstone National Park where I was going to work and then that didn't work out so then I went all the way to the Expediting Expo out in uh, yeah, Fort Wayne, Indiana. All of this on foot hitchhiking. And then I went from Indiana back down south through Kansas and Norman, Oklahoma, and etc. And then I came, went back west through the area that I'm at now, walking through here and hitchhiking on foot. And I went to Arizona, spent a few months in Arizona, and ended that year basically on foot the entire eight last eight months of that year out hitchhiking and living on the streets when I wasn't out to actually traveling so from that experience that's what this video is coming from and what the things that I kind of learned on the way what the good things to do the bad things to try to avoid etc so we will start with the topics of what you need to be to have on you to be prepared to go out hitchhiking the very first thing I would say is pay off any of your outstanding bills that you think someone would come after you for down the line you know the car loan or something even if you could return the car whatever the deal is you know if, if they would end up pursuing charges against you or something you want to have those kind of bills paid off before you ever hit out because you could get six months down the road and then have a warrant out for arrest for something that you didn't know you had I didn't have that experience I do have heard of other people having that kind of experience where they're hitchhiking and trying to live the free life and all of a sudden they're in jail or being transported somewhere back you know because with hitchhiking you'll end up having to deal with cops I hate to say it but a lot of the time you'll end up having to deal with cops because a lot of people concerned for your well-being will call the cops on you they they want to help you but they don't want to help you directly themselves so then their version of helping you is to call the cops and get some help for you so be aware of that while you're hitchhiking that you don't want to be wanted for anything because more than likely you will get checked at least once in every state I probably got checked or, or, or voluntarily gave over my ID to get checked even though technically speaking you don't have to uh, probably once I wouldn't say once every day but probably about twice a week or something hitchhiking and dealing with cops anyway to continue uh, to go over some of the basics of what you would need you need to be prepared for the weather all kinds of weather conditions because you don't know where you'll end up at i try to look at the weather map on my app on my phone before i head out anywhere the overnight temperature especially because if you're camping out overnight you definitely need to know that ahead of time where we're going it would behoove you to check the next city or the next state that you're going over to what kind of weather is ahead of time just like this weekend i'm waiting out arizona's weather and i'm living in a car this time but if I was on foot, I would definitely be looking at the weather. You want to be prepared for that. If you're going to go someplace where it rains all the time, you want to have a tarp or a raincoat. If you want to go off 
trying to hardcore hitchhike out in the snow i highly do not recommend it but if you do you know be prepared for that with you know steeper hiking boots and uh you know obviously winter coat and stuff keep yourself warm layer up other than that i would recommend light layers and then just layer on top I have a long sleeve shirt have a short sleeve shirt have like a lighter jacket or maybe a heavier jacket and then that way you can layer it all up on if you need to stay warm somewhere but you want to think about weight in your backpack you know because obviously the, the more and more you travel the more you'll notice less is more basically you'll want to carry less and less and less the longer and longer you go and I'm saying this from experience of walking 10 miles a day I didn't have to walk those miles but I, I decided it was better than just sitting at an on-ramp the entire time. I just started walking. And, if, and figured somebody would pick me up walking. And lo and behold, that actually does work out in your favor a lot better than sitting at on-ramps in my experience in terms of hitchhiking. Yeah, I waited around at that on-ramp for about an hour probably. And then I would start walking to the next, you know, few miles out. And usually by the time I got two or three miles out of town, out to the middle of nowhere... Somebody would pull over and then help me out. Because it puts you in a position where they drive by you. If you're on an on-ramp, they're like, ah, oh, somebody will help you out. No big deal. You know, I'd like to help him, but nah, next guy will get him. But if you're out walking in the middle of nowhere, then they're going to be like, well, there's less of a chance that somebody else is going to pull over. I better help. And that's one way to convince somebody to help pick you up. It would be to go out there and walk, so don't be afraid to walk. And I would say have a nice pair of hiking shoes to do that with. I recommend Skechers personally and put some doctor's soles in soles in the sketchers so that you have extra gel comfort for that in terms of weather again i would use bridges and building overhangs the front of an, a closed building like a doctor's office or dentist office overhang if it's raining you want to be looking for that kind of thing or if it's going to start raining and it's not rocket science you want to keep yourself dry because you don't want to walk around in wet clothes so if it's gonna about to rain or whatever even if the rain is an hour out, I would highly suggest going to immediately changing your way of thinking to finding an, an over, uh, either an overpass bridge that you can get under or a overhang off of a building that's closed that you can bide your time under so that you don't get wet. Um, straying from the list a little bit here, but bug spray and bear spray are also a couple things that might be worth carrying on you bear spray you can use against two-legged creatures like human beings or or uh, bears of course wolves anything else like that if you're gonna go out in the wildlife type areas but I would recommend if you want to have a good time hitchhiking I would recommend stay into the interstates along the interstates you will have better access to rides and you won't have to deal with wildlife like bobcats or mountain lions or wolves or coyotes potentially or bear and stuff like that you know um in the future someday i want to go up to alaska and i don't know yet if i'm gonna hitchhike that or not because that is you know i don't want to be armed if i was in alaska doing that so you have to think of where you're at versus you know in terms of the kind of tools that you would need to have with you if i'm going to be in alaska i'd probably want to have a gun just to stay armed okay everybody walks around alaska armed for a reason but in terms of bug spray, uh, the further you get away from human beings and where human beings gather like this truck stop, the further and further you get away from that, the more you'll notice that mosquitoes and gnats and stuff that just make you uncomfortable come out to play and bite you and everything because those places are not sprayed. You know, these places are actually sprayed. These truck stops and shopping centers and et cetera that you go to are actually sprayed because they want to keep people ha happy there so that they'll do business shopping there. Versus out on the open road when you're walking, you're going to need bug, bug spray. You have to be one with nature, so to speak, to go out there and hitchhike and want to do this kind of lifestyle. Because if you're not one with nature, you're going to be sorely disappointed. Um, I would also recommend a camouflage tarp. So that way you can hide your bag and hide where you're sleeping at night. But, but a lot of times you go into stores, they're not going to let you want to, they're not going to want to have let you... Uh, bring your backpack into the store under fear that you're gonna steal from them So they'll ask you to leave it in front or whatever and I don't like doing that But really when it comes down to it your only choices are to leave your bag in front of the store 
with whoever, which I don't like doing, or go and hide the bag real quick someplace around the store, which again, I'm not a big fan of doing, but this is why you keep all your valuables on you. Literally, your phone, your wallet, your money, all of it, have it on you in some way or another. Don't carry that kind of stuff in a bag, camera gear in a bag, etc., and then go try and hide it and whatever, because other homeless people or landscaping, you know, maintenance guys might come along and steal it or throw it away or whatever. So you want to only hide clothes, basically, just regular clothes in the bag, you know, and make it far enough away from the store that people... You want to find a spot that no one would be walking through. You wouldn't want walking traffic to go by. You wouldn't want, a, you know, a road next to a road where people driving by would see you putting it up. You want to find someplace way out of sight to hide your bags, usually behind bushes and stuff. I would only recommend having one backpack and then, like I say, have a camouflage tarp or something that would help hide it. For those times that you need to hide your bag because you'll find out, especially when you're going shopping and stuff, that you're going to need to have to hide your bag. Just make things easier to go into the store shopping and come back out. Um, and if you get a camouflage tarp, you can also help hide yourself at night when you're sleeping. Truck stop like this out in the middle of the desert. I would go way out there where there isn't nothing. At night time and sleep and then come back in. And that would be a little bit of trespassing because I have to go over the road. And then over a barbed bar wire fence. And anytime you have to cross over a fence, you are trespassing. But... I would rather get caught trespassing on somebody's land way out there in the middle of nowhere, potentially, than have to deal with people seeing me or waking me up somewhere near close to the truck stop. So, that's what I would do at night. I would camp out, you know, away from a truck stop, take your cart camouflage tarp with you, hide yourself. But again, when you're sleeping, you want to find a spot that somebody would not be driving by. You know, a reasonable person would not come by with their car because you don't want them to run you over. And you don't want to. You want to find some place where nobody usually walks by either. Find a hidden path and hide. Uh, always carry water and food. Trail mix, granola bars, canned foods, especially peanut butter. Peanut butter has a high protein value in it, and can get you by for one day if if you wind up in the middle of nowhere. You know, you get dropped off in the middle of nowhere. A can of a jar of peanut butter goes a long way, and it keeps it's got preservative in it and whatnot so it keeps pretty long too um have the canned foods have granola bars the, these trail mix these are the things that you can put in your backpack that are kind of light but they're emergency food that will give you energy while you're walking out in the middle of nowhere and it's always a good thing to have water and food on you especially in the desert uh sleeping bag I would say, depending on where you're at, have a sleeping bag or a mat or use local cardboard. When you're walking along, when I was hitchhiking, what I would do is I'd go behind the truck stop or wherever, find the cardboard only kind of dumpsters, if I can, preferably, if you could find the cardboard only dumpster, and then I would use a couple thick layers of cardboard to sleep on at night and maybe another layer of cardboard on top, and you'd be amazed what cardboard would do in terms of insulation. It would help you out. That way you only have to pack a sleeping bag on you and you have some kind of layer of insulation between you and the ground. Because the ground, the Earth's core, is at 55 degrees all the time. But then depending on where you're at, it varies. But basically 55 degrees will suck the cold out of your body, or the heat out of your body slowly overnight. And you will be miserable if you try to sleep directly on the ground. So I highly recommend using cardboard. And the reason I highly recommend that over packing something like a mat, you can buy a yoga mat and bring it with you if you want to and that's another option to do but you have to roll it up and you have to have it on you all the time you know what I mean it's just another thing to have to pack when cardboard is really readily available anywhere as long as you get dropped off somewhere that has any kind of business or building it will usually have cardboard in the dumpster so you would go get a couple cleaner layers of cardboard sleep put the cardboard back in the dumpster in the morning and gone you go and it helped you out for the night you didn't have to pack it with you and it's just a tip that I leave, you know, for you because it's, it's one less thing that you have to pack. But it's available and it works. Uh, sleeping bag, depending on where you're at, I would recommend at least your bare bones basic $20 sleeping bag from Walmart that would be good down to 30 degrees. 
I'd say, at least down to freezing. But then I also try to avoid trying to hitchhike through places that are below freezing, just for my own health, both the inside of my lungs, you know, and your body outside. I would recommend not hitchhiking through areas that are below freezing, if you can help it. Again, that comes back to checking the weather and making sure you don't go through places like that. Uh, I would recommend a, <coughs> a power, <coughs> excuse me, a powered phone, extra powered phone. It's not your regular phone that you use every day. That you leave, you have it powered, but you leave it off until you need it. And then all phones, whether they have service or not, are required by law to be able to call and access 911 emergency services. <clears throat> the reason I say this is because you get out in the middle of nowhere might be the same time that you didn't get your phone completely charged that day and by the time you got out there in the middle of nowhere with your ride they leave you in the middle of nowhere in a couple of places and it does kind of happen on occasion yeah you want to be able to have a backup plan not that I'm a big fan of calling the cops to help me or do something you know out in the middle of nowhere but you can call 911 using that phone and then they will send the cops or the firemen or ambulance crew or somebody out to get you and bring you back to the nearest kind of civilization because they have to by law for your own safety take you to some place that's got civilization around especially if that's what you called for whether you actually need a health emergency or not it helps to have that phone for that reason because it's just peace of mind in the back of your head knowing that you have a phone that has power on it that's off and you're in, on you somewhere that you never use for a regular thing that's specifically there for 911. I hope you never have to use it, but it's a, something to have. You can also buy, go more expensive and buy the satellite GPS kind of thingies they got nowadays where you push a button and it tracks it and tells emergency services and they come out and get you. But I've heard that costs money both to buy and subscription to keep it. And then it costs, might cost more money from the medical people that they send to get you. So you have to take that into account. I'm not sure on what they are. But I've heard they, the starting cost on that is like 270 bucks. But you can buy a regular phone, old phone like this that's 40 bucks or 60 bucks. That's a smartphone that'll get you the basics of what you need. Or you can buy an even cheaper phone for like 20 bucks. It's just literally a phone and that's it. No data or nothing. That just has phone service. And any one of those phones, whether you actually have service on it or not, can call 911. And I highly recommend you have that on you. Powered, like I said, and then shut off so that you have it ready in case you need it. I use Google Maps <clears throat> and Street View all the, all the time to plan my trips. And I highly recommend before you even start out hitchhiking that you know the city that you're going to go to next to the town or wherever it is, like the truck stop you're going to come to, and that you Street View it and you see everything that's around it before you go there. Try not try to as much as you can pre-plan, but with hitchhiking you're kind of stuck going as far as the driver would take you, or as far as you want to go with the driver. You know, there's different things that could come up. Sometimes you have to wing it, but I say use Google Maps a lot and be prepared. Um, you usually doctors' offices, shopping centers, uh, anywhere that does any kind of landscaping that you can you can tell the kind of places that are landscaped where. The, they have cut down grass or they have special bushes and stuff like that. Anywhere that you can see where they water the grass or the bushes, they will have an outlet usually to power whatever they're using for landscaping. Doctor's offices and dentist's offices are the best places to find this because it seems like every doctor or dentist office I've ever been to has an outlet on, on each side of the building all the way around. All four sides of the building have at least one outlet and it's for the landscaping. Uh, you go there after the doctor's office is closed, obviously, and you probably sleep there that night and power your phone using the outlet. Would be my recommendation on the best place to find an outlet. Um, in front of Walmart, there's outlets, but you have to basically sit there with your phone in front of everybody at the Walmart. But if you don't care, you don't care, you know. But there's outlets there. Basically, on the road, you'll have to look for outlets unless you buy your own solar power pack or a little battery pack to access your phone. I have two little battery packs that I carry on with me. Again, because you don't want to be out in the middle of nowhere. I have, like, let's say this truck stop and a couple other places and find no outlets inside or out that you can use. You know, you want to have a battery pack or something that you can portably charge your phone if you had to. 
uh, bright vest depending on the state and if you're walking sometimes helps sometimes not but it's nice to have a bright regular vest like that the two reasons they help and not is if you're trying to hitchhike off an on-ramp that has a work zone a construction zone work zone on the road and you're walking around like this with a backpack on people aren't gonna miss take you for the construction worker and they're not gonna help you but out in the middle of nowhere where it's nothing but road and desert let's say and I'm walking especially if I'm walking at night which I try not to but if especially if I'm walking at night you want to have a visible vest on you to make yourself more visible from further out and people have time or have more time to determine if they're going to help you or not as they're driving by especially if you're trying to walk the interstate at 70 or 80 miles an hour you know it doesn't get much time for people to decide whether they're going to help you or not you can walk the, the interstate cops don't like it DOT people don't like it but I can tell you from experience it's not illegal even though they try to say they can take you to jail and yada 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 in truth the USA cannot restrict your freedom especially when it comes to walking because you're not driving or anything if you're driving that's its own issue because driving is a privilege and not a right but if you're walking you're literally traveling you have that privilege anyway I mean that right and they try to say it's illegal it's unsafe it's definitely unsafe to get on the interstate and walk on the shoulder of the interstate with 70 or 80 mile an hour traffic going by you definitely highly unsafe and you are taking that risk yourself to do that but it's not illegal I wouldn't argue with the officer but let's just say I've had numerous encounters with different cops in different states every single one of them tried to say I can't and, and couldn't do anything about it I, have, I even had California Highway Patrol tell me yell at me at gunpoint to get off the interstate and I just put my hands up like this like don't shoot me and kept walking along the shoulder of the interstate because what are you gonna do shoot me for walking all he could do he I called his bluff and all he could do was drive behind me in that lane with his lights on and make sure nobody else would would pick me up of course defeating the point of my walking so I walked a half a mile with him doing that just to do it to him since he's doing it to me I'm gonna do it to him and then I got off the interstate at that half a mile but he ma he mainly did that just so no one else would pick me up for my safety technically but he couldn't make me not walk the interstate so I mean just to say it is possible to walk the interstate whether people say it's not or not those signs that say you're prohibited from having pedestrians on the interstate and yada yada that's all that's all it is a signage that's not backed up by law you know they prefer they might as well say we prefer that you don't walk the interstate and for obvious reasons but it's not illegal but i'm just saying have the white vest but don't use it on a regular on-ramp because people will mistake you for a worker don't use it especially near a work zone because people will mistake you for a worker and not give you rides because they think you're working there but you this comes highly valuable out there in the middle in the desert in the middle of nowhere it gives them people plenty of time to notice somebody's walking and two, if, if you had to walk at night, it's valuable to have this. And there is occasions where I had to walk on the highway at night. I didn't want to, but I had to leave where I'm at or whatever. You know, if I was at a truck stop for a while during the day and then they asked me to leave, you know, the next thing would be the cops would show up and trespass me if I didn't leave. And if that's the only place there, I, the only other option I had was either camp out at night or if I still wanted to get going someplace or into the city or whatever, I'd have to walk. And so... There's a couple times that this comes in handy. Um, always have a vest or zipper pocket coat or some or shirt, something that's got all sorts of pockets on it that you can put all your valuables in. Because I, I for one, have three pairs of glasses, I think three phones, two battery packs, my wallet, a knife. And I can't think of what else at the moment, but those basic things, and I want to pack them on me at all times. You want, do not want to put them in your bag. You want to have a bag with you so you have room to put extra crap, mostly a sleeping bag and clothes. But you don't want anything valuable in your bag. You want to have that on you all the time and, and within easy to reach areas. 
because the more and more you walk the more you'll find out it's a lot easier if you could just unzip something and there you go and I recommend highly recommend something that's a zippered pocket coat or a zippered pocket vest that I have behind me back there a regular fishing vest not the best thing to, in the world to actually hitchhike with because you look like a fisherman <laughs> doing it so I don't I try not to hitchhike with it on but it helps to have especially for at night those zippered pockets that if somebody were to come along where you're sleeping if you're out camping sleeping the, the one time that you're the most vulnerable is when you're asleep and so you want to limit how much somebody can get to you because if they're trying to unzip your pockets and everything you're going to feel it they're going to literally feel them filling you up so you want to have zipped up coat or vest for those reasons just to have your fireballs way easy to access to you right to you and don't put that in your bag I say don't put that in your bag because there are occasions when you get like a two-door pickup and they only will give you a ride if you put your backpack in the back of the thing because for their own security the driver doesn't want you to have that you know that bag that could have a gun in it or whatever literally on you they want to separate you from your bag and put it in the back of the, of the pickup and I can see where that's reasonable but at the same time you have to judge for yourself that character that driver if he's trying to, to possibly steal your bag from you and so on you know and that's why I only carry clothes in the bag I haven't had it happen to me but I'm just saying it can happen uh, really good shoes I recommend Skechers like I was saying before because in my experience if you sat at an on-ramp you could be there anywhere from five minutes to a couple hours to all day long and nobody would help you at an on-ramp I've had experience at getting a ride without an on-ramp don't get me wrong that's what I always try to do first and foremost because it's a risk to walk on the highway or interstate but I found nine times out of ten that if you get on the, the road and start walking on the shoulder of the interstate with your thumb out people are a little more apt to help you out a mile down the road when you're not around any other services or anything you don't want to be in the middle of the city trying to do that but you, that's why you want to be on the edge of the city at the last truck stop or wherever and then start walking the interstate if you have to that's up to you and your own safety as to whether you get on the interstate or not I just say it works out better if you do in my opinion it's a risk but it works out better uh, what your thumb sign should say if you, if you if you choose to write out a sign instead of just thumbing it what you do makes a difference so I would recommend being shaved and respectable looking having something like this the, the I read the no one fights alone flat shirt I don't know if you can really see it supporting the troops and the police and the firefighters and all that first responders have some kind of a shirt like that on or or else just have a blank nothing on no, right now I'm not nothing on but you know what I mean a blank shirt that has no writing because you want to appeal to the most audience and a scruffy homeless looking dude that has a beard a mile long looks like he hasn't bathed in years it's not gonna appeal to your audience you know, I as a driver would not want to pick somebody up that's like that. And obviously you wouldn't either if you were driving. So, you know, you want to be that respectable person that you would pick up. But what you're, if you, going along that lines, if you choose to fly a sign to help drivers, and sometimes it does help drivers if you're on an on-ramp and you say you're an hour away from Albuquerque and you want to go to Albuquerque, you write Albuquerque on the sign hour away the drivers know how far you want to go sometimes that will help because they know it's only an hour I only have to deal with this guy for an hour if I'm gonna give him a ride and sometimes it will help you you know or they love the fact that you're going to Albuquerque or wherever the hell you're trying to go and it sometimes it does increase your chances of getting a ride if you fly basically put up a sign that says the town name but I wouldn't go hours and hours away if you're trying to get to Washington State let's say you're in Lordsburg Arizona like I am let's say and you're trying to get to Washington State or Portland, Oregon or something. If you put Portland, Oregon on your sign, most drivers are going to drive right by you because they decide that they're they're not going to be able to help you because they're not going to Portland or they're not going that far. You know, they don't realize that they can help you an hour down the road in whatever direction you're going and that would help you get that far. They just immediately say, oh, Portland, Oregon on my mind. I can't help that guy.
gives them another excuse not to. You know, so instead of doing that, you want to name the next town over in whatever direction you're going to, and then just do that every time. On those signs, if you're going to make a sign, only do it the next town over and only do about a maximum of, of an hour away. Max. I would not go more than an hour. Because if you just tell them that it's something that's two and a half hours away, like say I'm, I think, about three hours away from Phoenix, and I put Phoenix on there, unless that guy's going to Phoenix or through Phoenix, it's not going to happen. Even if he's going two hours toward it, he's going to be like, nope, two hours is too long for me to help. I'd like to help that guy, but nope, I'm not going to put up with him for that long. Because you're basically putting out a contract that says, I want to go this far. And then it's up to them to help you out with that contract. It's, it makes them feel like it's a contracted deal. So, signs help. Sometimes they help, sometimes not. The best sign I could say to fly for a thumb sign would be just a gigantic thumb. That's it. You know, if you're going west with a gigantic thumb, you could put the word west on there with a thumb. You know, but... Signs sometimes help, sometimes they don't. I've had a couple old ladies try and tell me that it looked dangerous. With, you know, a big old sign. So, it, it just depends. But I would definitely try different things, especially if you're sitting on an on-ramp for an hour. If you're sitting on an on-ramp for an hour, thumbing it like this, and nobody's picked you up in an hour, I would consider either finding some kind of sign and writing on there, you know, I don't want to go this far, blah, blah, blah. Or uh, hitchhiking out on the interstate or whatever highway that you're on. Because I tend to do better when I was hitchhiking. When I was actually hiking. The hiking part of hitchhiking. And I've actually had a couple, two or three people tell me that I, they would not have picked me up. But then they saw me walking on an interstate and putting the effort in myself to out, get out there and walk. And not just sit there all day. You know. Or other people would pull over and say, oh, I didn't know you were a hitchhiker. I thought you were just a stranded motorist. Or something. But either way, now that I'm pulled over, you know, I'll help you out. But I thought, you know, you might be broke down here, blah, blah, blah. And don't be afraid to use other people's cars that have been left behind, you know. they already got the sticker on them and everything. Don't be afraid to be, you know, a mile ahead of that car and post up shop, so to speak, with your thumb out. Because people will think that was your car and you had, you know, problems. And sometimes because you have a car, you're better than a hitchhiker in their minds. I don't know, but it's a way to kind of get by it. I'm starting to sweat a little, as you can see. I have the windows up to keep the wind down because this truck's up kind of loud with the windows down. So I'm going to try and get through the rest of this. Uh, don't be afraid to get dropped off in the middle of nowhere. I've had a couple of rides in, I think it was Utah, where the woman, nice old fat lady, basically showed up and said she can help me out, but where she can drop me off at past the sign that I was flying where she can drop me at, off at was like halfway and it was going to be a teeny tiny little gas station in the middle of nowhere and I'm like well you know halfway to the middle of nowhere you know don't be afraid to get out there in the middle of nowhere because what I found out from those experiences are you tend to get picked up faster in the middle of nowhere so I took that ride and lo and behold 10 minutes later in another van and gone why because they did not believe somebody was out here in the middle of nowhere. And they're like, wow, I better help that guy out. <laughs> you know? He's definitely the adventurous type. Look at him out here thumbing it in the middle of nowhere, you know? It took a couple hours in either direction away from anything, you know, besides this gas station. So don't be afraid of getting out there in the middle of nowhere. It actually does help. Trust your guts and instincts when it comes to getting in with a driver. I mean, it should be said and done. Nothing against the people who do smoke or anything, but if a guy, like a dirty kid style dude, drives up with a beater car and he's got weed on his shirt or he's toking it up or something, you know, it's up to you to get into a vehicle like that. But my preference would not be to get into a vehicle like that because, or someone who's been drinking, preferably, but I have a couple times gotten into a vehicle where people were drunk, but I immediately offered to drive for them because I'm the sober guy, you know, what the hell. I might as well you know, do my part and drive for them if they want to be drinking. And it actually works out when you do that kind of a contract, so to speak. But, you know, you have to sum the guy up, for lack of a better thing. You know, I hate to be prejudiced or anything, but you have to sum it up. The person drives up to you, 
do they look like a, a good reasonable person or do they look like they're gonna do something to you or what and you have to go with your guts if something's red flagging say no nah, no nah, this guy's not, not gonna happen uh -uh. then don't take the ride there's always another ride 10 minutes down the road don't f make yourself feel like if i don't take that ride i'm gonna be stuck here and there can be situations where i was out in the middle of the desert in um uh, can't remember the town now might have been as i was going up to the cabin i'm not sure but i was out in the middle of nowhere near Laughlin, Nevada, I think. And I'd been there for two or three days trying to hitchhike out. And then this guy come up and he was pretty scary looking like that. But I thought it over, you know, like, do I really, really, really want to take that ride or not? You know? And it's hard to say no at those points when you get to some place where you're stuck there for two or three days. You just about want to get in anybody's car and go, but you gotta watch that for your own safety. You know, if there's too much of a red flag, don't take that ride. And I'm not trying to say that to make it scared. I mean, I've turned down a couple rides, but all the rides that I did have, except for this one guy that was in Minnesota that looked like Jeffrey Dahmer, pretty much. I mean, he had the mannerisms of Jeffrey Dahmer. He, you know, made me wonder if I was going to get chopped up and ate or something. That guy was a little bit scary to ride with. He was a good guy. Don't get me wrong. He was a good guy. He saved my ass from this state park that I've been walking through for a day and a half. But that was kind of the only fishy ride, but it never did anything. Most people who pull over to help you out have a good heart, and they did so for that reason. But, you know, you may have to look out for some truck drivers, because some truck drivers are lonely, and they want sexual favors, stuff like that. I never did anything at any of that, but I've seen a dirty kid get offered that. Yeah, they're kind of, truck drivers are a different breed. Some are good, some are not so good. But at the same time, a lot of truck drivers just want company on the road because they've spent hours and hours and hours in their truck. And they'd rather talk to somebody than, you know, listen to music anymore. Because he does get old after a while after being an expediter in that uh, Sprinter van like a like a truck driver, but in a van. I can tell you from experience, I can see where they're coming from with that because it does just get old being on the road all the time alone. Uh, pack light. Don't use lots of bags. I've seen people out there with six or eight bags on the side of the road with their thumb up. And I truly wonder how in the hell they ever get a ride because me as a driver, I'd look, take one look at that and go, unless I have a pickup where you can put everything in the back, back. I don't want all that crap in here. I don't want to help that guy with all that crap. No, you know, and I can't believe people actually hitchhike like that with six or eight bags. I'm like, and the majority of the time, those people are people who got evicted from where they're at and they're just literally trying to get across country to someplace else to live. And that's it, they're not being a, basically a true hitchhiker so much as just needing the ride one dime and that's it and more power to them I wish them luck but if you want to go out here and make this a thing a year-long thing like I did you definitely don't want six bags just for your own having to pack six bag if I were you I would pack a really light backpack and that's it because you can buy everything you need elsewhere and while we're on that subject if you can help it, try to save a hundred or a couple hundred dollars and put that in the sole of your shoe, between the sole and the other, you know, the other end of your shoe, and leave that alone as your backup safety savings account in case somebody steals your backpack or somebody drives away and separates you from your backpack. You always want to have an emergency money available some way or another that you can buy a sleeping bag, maybe another coat, or you know, your basic clothes or whatever if you have to have to do it. That's what I tried to always do was have a couple, like 200 bucks on me that I'd put in the sole of my shoe. That way if somebody tried to rob me or whatever, they wouldn't know it was in my shoe unless I gave it away that there's money in my shoe, obviously. But, and that's to make it, you know, I don't want to make everything sound nasty and dangerous and scary because that's not the case. I'm just, you got to plan for what if, you know. If this kind of thing happens, what am I going to do? And the, you have to have answers for those plans, for those questions. So I would always pack money with me like that and not touch it and it was my backup account just in case because I did get robbed in Hawaii as I was sleeping. That guy stole my backpack and I think it was for the backpack because it was brand new, had molly straps on it and I think he liked the backpack I think is why he did it. But that just goes to show that you know I learned from that lesson and you also want to have all your variables on you especially when you're sleeping because of that. Uh, 
you want to try to wear generic clothes because you got to look at hitchhiking like a play pretty much you're the actor in the play and you're trying to appeal to an audience because that's essentially what you're doing you've got to wave and smile and thumb it and have decent looking clothes and like i say be shaved you've got to appeal to or to your audience or you're not going to get anybody to help you and wearing generic clothes that don't have any kind of writing on it kind of sometimes helps the picture because then you don't put off a negative vibe or a positive vibe or anything you're just a guy standing there versus if you had a shirt let's say that has a big you know i don't know 420 friendly or drugs or anything on it not that i'm saying that's anything bad but you're going to attract the same kind of crowd now if you want to attract the same kind of crowd you want to get in the car and smoke smoke it up with somebody then by all means if that's what you want to do then wear the weed shirt you know i personally would not do so because they're putting your own life at risk riding around with someone else who may or may not care in their head you know and the reason why i would wear a shirt more like this that supports the troops and the cops and everything else whether we do or not is this makes people feel comfortable with it comfortable with you because it it says i i don't make it a tendency to break the law you know it says i'm not a murderer if i support all these people you know and people are more apt to help you out because they may be the firefighter or the nurse <laughs> or the police officer or the ex-military that you're appealing to on the shirt and personally i would rather ride with somebody that's like that than someone who might be on the fringes of society even though i'm on the fringes of society at the moment when i'm doing it you know you want to kind of cater to the audience that you want uh If if the ride is kind of shady, or if you can do it fast enough, I would recommend taking a picture, quick picture of the plate, usually the back plate, so we don't see you doing it, but the black plate, back plate, license plate of the vehicle, and kind of a, a get the whole pic, the whole vehicle in the picture, so they get, so you have a description of the vehicle in case you get separated from your bag or anything funky happens. They try to do something to you and you get out and whatever. You have a way you know actual proof video or photo of what they look like or what the car looked like so that the cops can pull up on it if you have to go that route you know if it feels sketchy you might want to quickly maybe take a picture of that just in case to have a backup plan so you might be able to recover your bag later or whatever it is try to keep your bag with you and not get separated from your bag Occasionally that can't be helped and you know if it's a small enough vehicle like a little two-door pickup and they've already got a whole bunch of their own stuff in the in the car and like I said some people don't like you having the bag with you because they don't know if you're going to pull a gun out and rob them or whatever you know so yeah you have to kind of judge it by the character as to whether or not you're willing to separate yourself from your bag and put that bag in the back trunk of the car or wherever you know if it's a nice old lady I wouldn't mind putting my bag in the back of the trunk of the car like she asked you know she's giving me a ride i don't think she's gonna steal my backpack for any reason yeah i mean if it happens it happens but that's why you only put clothes in it clothes in a sleeping bag but you, you know in my mind you'd have to be the scum of the earth so to speak to steal from a hitchhiker but it could happen i'm just saying try not to separate yourself from the bag now if it's an old again if it's an old lady that's giving me a ride i'd be totally fine with just sitting up front and having my backpack in the trunk wouldn't have an issue with it now if it's a teenager 18 year old teenager that looks like he might may or may not be up to any good i would personally either say i want to have my backpack in front of me in front of me you know in my lap or on the floorboard in front of me or i'm not taking the ride sorry not happening <laughs> thanks for helping trying to help me out but nah not happening man and the reason that i would do that is for protection you have a bag so you have a layer of something between you and them if they go to try to stab you or do something to you you at least have something to as a wall to put between you and them to allow you to escape if that was the case you know not everything's going to be that bad but i'm saying you have to be aware of such things and what would happen if this happens you know what are you going to do if this happens what are you going to do if that happens think it through in your head already of the scariest things that could happen even though they you know nine times out of ten they don't happen but occasionally they could happen so you want to be prepared for that and like I say, you have to judge them by the character. If it was a teenage kid that kind of looks up to no good, I would probably keep my backpack with me. If it's a nice older grandma type lady, you know, I'd go ahead and put my bag in the trunk. 
because you can you can tell by a person's nature you know if they're religious and stuff like that. you can also look around for hints in the car like they're religious like they've got a cross you know hanging from their mirror or whatever they got an american flag because they're a veteran or something like that you can tell that by the way people decorate their cars if they treat their car good you can not see hardly any any trash around and then you know that's a good person to be around if they throw trash everywhere you know it may or may not be a good idea to but it's, it's, it just depends on you. You know, if the person pulls up, you have to make the judgment call yourself and decide if that person is safe enough to ride with or not. The other thing you do have to be aware of is not all drivers out there who have a driver's license, and some people don't even have a driver's license, but not all driver's license people out there should be driving. And what I mean by that is there are... I don't want to get stereotypic again, but there are women, mostly, that I, it just drives me nuts to ride along with some women who just do not look they they change lanes on the interstate and they, you can tell they didn't look in their mirror it can be scary you know so what it, i mean when you're when you're riding with someone you want to make sure you always remember that it's two sides to the story you can end that ride anytime you want to end that ride you're not stuck with them just because they were nice enough to try to help you out if they're too scary to ride with you just tell them flat out right you know i don't feel safe in this car would you please let me out you know i've never had to do it yet but you need to be prepared to do that if that's the case because you do have to realize that driving 70 or 80 miles down the road or mile an hour down the road and and what is essentially a weapon and if they're not experienced enough to handle it etc you can end up dying from getting in with a driver that shouldn't have been driving you know if they look like the type of person that would run from the cops. You know what I mean, you just, you gotta watch for yourself. Uh, try to limit your trip to one hour, like I said, both on the sign, you know, if you're an hour away from Albuquerque, you put Albuquerque on there for an hour away, and for the drive. If they tell you, you know, once you get in the car with them, say you said Albuquerque, hour away or something, and then once you get in the car with them, they ask you how far you're going, and you're saying, I want to go to North Dakota. And they say, we're happened, well, I happen to be going to North Dakota. You know, it's up to you at that point if you want to take the entire trip to North Dakota, like they say, or not, you know. And then, again, depending on their character, I would either ask if I could tag along, you know, and get as far as you can get. And t you know. Maybe. It's a possibility, a small possibility. But the majority of time, I would only go about an hour ride with people. Because you're missing out on experiences with other rides with other people, for one thing. Two, if it's a guy, they could have, possibly have bad intentions for you once it gets dark. You know, you gotta remember that if it's a couple hours from dark, they might say, yeah, yeah, I'll go to North Dakota, but then only drive a couple hours worth in the dark until it's dark out and then try to do something. So you have to, again, judge the person by the character. If they look like a guy that ain't gonna have any problems with you in the dark, then continue on with them. If they don't, you know, you may want to say, no, no, man, I'm good. I'm only gonna go to Albuquerque. I wanna rest up and do this and that. And, you know, all you gotta do is make up some kind of excuse that I don't wanna be in the car longer an hour. And most people understand that. Uh, if you're gonna go out here hitchhiking, you need to have basic directions by being able to follow the sun. You need to know that in the morning the sun rises in the east, the sun sets in the west, you know, and you know, obviously when the sun's up in the middle of the sky it's about noon. And you need to know that so that you know east and west, and then if you know east and west you'll be able to figure out where north and south is. And the reason I say that is because you could get out in the middle of nowhere at the same time that your phone dies and then you don't know where the hell you're at. You know, it's common sense. And then... If, let's say, you fell asleep in the car that you felt comfortable with, some person driving you, and it's an hour down the road, when you wake up, you want to be able to immediately tell if you're still going north, or still going west, or still going east, or whatever, you know. It would behoove you to tell if they hadn't changed directions on you, because people could. I'm not trying to scare people away, I'm just trying to tell you that this kind of thing could happen, and you need to think about it and be prepared. Um... For income, I, uh, you either come out here with a fixed income or you plan on doing day labor. Or you can fly a sign or sometimes at the end of your ride people will help try and help you out the best they can and give you 20 bucks or 100 bucks or something. 
get by well-known food. Uh, if you go into cafes or restaurants, especially out in the middle of nowhere, and you just walk up to the waitress, like one time I did on the way going to Yellowstone, and I walked in there, and basically I wasn't hungry at the moment. I just wanted a place to sit down for a minute because I'd been walking for a while and plug in my phone. That's all I asked her, you know, if I could you know, go sit in the corner and plug my phone in for a little while and leave. And then uh, she said, sure, go ahead, have at it. And I did that, and pretty soon she'd come around with coffee, and then she wanted to hear my story, blah, blah, blah. And so I told her all my story, but this is where all I've been, this is what I've done. People love hearing your story, especially your hitchhiking story, because it's freedom. A lot of these people are 9 to fivers. they're stuck in these jobs, that they're doing the American dream, as they say, and working 40 years in the same place, paying their bills, and they're just not happy in life. So when somebody comes along that's living the adventure that they'd like to be able to do, but they feel envious of it. And they want to know and, and pretty much experience through you everything that happened. You know, that caused you to do that, that. How you got out there and did that. and You know, because they're scared to do it themselves. And through doing that, the longer and longer she talked to me, the more, you know, and basically I think she bought me dinner and everything. She came back around with a donut and some kind of breakfast, I think it was helping me out and I'm, I'm relatively sure she paid for it either that or she just had the diner pay for it I don't, know. don't know but I wasn't really hungry at the time but I took them up on that so obviously you know anytime you're out on the road you want, definitely want to take people up on them helping you out that makes them feel good then you're obviously taken care of for that day um I will talk a little bit about there's day labor places like uh people ready I think they call it now it used to be slave ready but people ready where you go and you sign up beforehand and then you get out there early you work an eight hour day and then they pay you that night using their app and whatnot there's places that you could do that there's like courier type of places if you have a bike that you can go around and bring people stuff on a motor uh, bicycle and get paid to do that outside of that for income you either come on the road with an income fixed income or you save up ahead of time and then live off of that or you do the day labor, or if you have to, you come out here and fly a sign on an interstate exit, which I'm not a big fan of doing, but I've had to do before being broke, and ask for somebody's help. And I can guarantee you, if you're scared of food, or not, I'm scared of not ha having food, I guarantee you, you go to a any fast food, and, not, and fast food ain't the greatest, but let's say you go out in front of McDonald's, and you fly something that says McHungry on it, you're going to get fit in five minutes flat. So you never have to worry about food out here on the road. People are more than willing to help you with food as long as they know it's going right to food. Everybody has no problem whatsoever with buying you a dinner. Here or there, not that I want to live off of everybody, but at the same time when you... The only way to do this adventure of hitchhiking is for that long of a period of time, of eight months or a year or whatever would be pretty much living off of other people in certain places. And there's other places like Phoenix where you can sign up and be there for day labor. But the thing about day labor is if you don't have a car, you have to pitch in some of your money from the day to pay the driver that did drive you out to some place, and you are second on the list if you don't have a car yourself. So they in bigger offices like Phoenix, they'll use you. In other places, they'll be like, well, if you don't have a car, we can't help you. You know, we'd love, to, we'd love to be able to help you, but if you can't get there on your own, you know, or use public transportation or something, we can't help. So you have to keep that in mind for day labor-wise. Some other things, like I was just saying, you can use public trans transit for work. Or for two bucks to five bucks, somewhere there, you can get across the city like Phoenix. From one side of, of Phoenix, like Mesa, 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 all the way out to like Avondale or wherever. You can get all the way across the city. It might take you four hours worth of doing. But you can jump on this bus and that train and this subway and that whatever trans and you make use of those public uh transit systems because there's no way you're pretty much going to be able to hitchhike kind of around a city it's faster and easier just to get into the city at a truck stop or wherever and then use the local bus system for two bucks or five bucks or whatever and go across town to the next truck stop and then hit continue hitchhiking out because trying to hitchhike in a city, people hardly ever, if ever, pick you up. They might pick you up and take your next exit, but it's highly unlikely. You want to get on the edges of the city to be able to hitchhike. Uh, the other use of public transit system is uh, Greyhound. 
Right now during COVID, I wouldn't recommend any public transit systems and I'd probably recommend not hitchhiking for a while because of COVID. You know, because of the whole safety factor of being around other people. But back in the day when I did it, Greyhound has an app in which you can, most, the cheapest trips you can take is about 20 bucks. It's about 20 bucks, roughly anywhere you go to the next town or whatever. The more and more you do it, the more the, the discounts you get. So every now and then I, I paid 12 bucks to get from this town to that town using Greyhound. But the secret to it is every six, uh, if you sign up to the rewards program, every 16 trips was a free one. So what I would do is I would do 16 $20 trips, you know, 20 bucks here to the next town, 20 bucks there to the next town. And it was sometimes faster and easier than having to hitchhike or fly or whatever if I had the money. You know, you just use the 20 bucks, down the road you go. And a lot of times, it, grounds will drop off at these truck stops and stuff like that. Or the driver might drop you off at an unscheduled stop someplace along the road if you, if you ask nicely enough. And it's not that far off the route. They might just pull over off the interstate and let you out. If you need to in certain areas. But anyway... Uh, Using their app, you buy those 16, 16, worth, 16 trips worth of 20 bucks a trip or 12 bucks, you know, here or there or whatever. Using the app, you can find all sorts of cheap deals, and they send you deals every now and then in your email. But on the 16th trip, it's free. So what you do is you save up all that money and time, and then if, you want, if you're in Florida by the time you do this and you want to go to California, obviously, you would wait for that free trip. And then you book that free trip from California all I mean from Florida all the way to California using the bus. And that way you get all your money back worth of paying those 20 bucks for 16 times. Because 20 times 5 is 100. By the time you end up doing that, you paid about 250 into it. And it didn't feel like it because you only paid 20 bucks this day or that day to be able to get on the bus and go and do that. And it's not hitchhiking, yeah, I know. But sometimes it can save you where you're at. You know, if you've been trying to hitchhike for a while and can't get out of there, but then you happen to notice there's a loop, there's a ground station, it may save you from who knows how long trying to get out of there. So, um, most of the time hitchhiking, you can get out within a day or two, but occasionally where you're at, you know, especially if you're near a prison. If you're near a prison and the road signs say, don't pick up hitchhikers because they could be a prisoner <laughs> on the road, you know, that's a place you don't want to be hitchhiking. Obviously, because people have read that already and been like, uh-oh. You know, and that, and they may call the cops on you thinking you are a prisoner, because that's what the sign said. Uh, in terms of showers, I have shower power, so I get a free shower a day out of Flying J or Pilots, so I just go there and do it. But if you didn't have that, you can go, or you used to be able to go. Right now you can't go in the truck lounge or do it. But you used to be able to, before COVID, go into the trucker's lounge and just ask somebody. You know, there's 15 truck drivers sitting there watching TV. You walk in there and politely ask somebody, has anybody got a free shower crate? And most likely they'll hook you up with a shower. Because there's a lot of drivers out here that just have showers upon showers listed on their thing. And they have no problem whatsoever hooking you up with a shower. Most of the time. Sometimes you might get run off from the place, but most of the time you go in there and within five minutes flat you'll be able to find somebody to give you a shower. Uh... Be alone rough and stick to yourself to sleep. I highly recommend it. Don't hang out with other dirty kids. I mean, you can do so whatever you want to do during the daytime. Dust up away with them. They're a good resource to know where everything's at in the direction you're going, especially if they came from the west and they're going east and you're going west. You know, they may have some good hints of where this is and where that is along your journey because they were just there. So they're a good resource to talk to during the day. However, make it a point not to go off with you know, and hang out with and party and sleep next to them or whatever out in the middle of nowhere because odds are pretty good they're either going to beat you up and take your stuff or they're going to just try and take your stuff in your sleep because there's sometimes a hidden agenda with dirty kids and stuff like that so I try to avoid those people especially anytime after dark but if nothing else I would hang out continue to hang out at the truck stop till they finally decide to leave you know, or try to hitchhike out, out at night like I've had to do before to get away from people because it's you're safer if no one knows you're, you're there and no one, you know, it's all around no one knows you're there. The cops don't know, the property owners don't know, the homeless people don't know, the dirty kids don't know. You're safer if no one knows you're there when you're sleeping because of how vulnerable you are when you're sleeping if you're camping out someplace. I mean, if you have the money, if you come out on the road and you have 10 grand, 
and you want to go stay at a hotel every now and then at night or whatever more power to you but and there are hotel discounts and stuff like that you that you can get if you have the money to do it you know like right now i'm top tier for choice and because i've worked myself way up to the top tier for choice i get like 40 or 50 percent discounts at the moment just being the top tier and choice is deal for the choice hotel network and so technically all the hotels around this area are like 30 or 40 bucks or something like that plus tax so i could afford to do it if i wanted to but there are discounts that you can do if you sign up for these hotel programs if you have the money to do it if you don't have the money to do it then you're out, out, out here as a lone wolf camping then i would suggest being out there by yourself uh one other couple things i want to mention is the 211 you dial 211 on your phone that's the helpline for the local county resource assistance line anywhere you go basically dial 211 and send and you will be connected with basically what is a helpline that will help you with a hotel or they sometimes if you have a car they help you with gas um trying to think what else they help you with other like homeless type of resources it's like if you need clothes or you're desperate and you need food or something they will send somebody out to help you on the 211 line usually not all places have the 211 but it's worth checking if you're in a desperate type of situation say if somehow you got dropped off in the middle of a snowstorm blizzard or something and you don't have the clothes to get survived doing that but you don't want to call 911 immediately or something you can call 211 and they'll set you up with the local resources they'll let you know where there's a homeless shelter and stuff like that if you need to go that route it's good to know that information ahead of time 411 is a local information line mostly a tourist thing tells you what's all to do in the area and 511 is your local weather line if you don't have internet you can at least call 511 and it'll tell you what the local weather that you're at is supposed to be just so you know uh you can use thrift stores they're cheaper to get clothes uh homeless shelters will give you clothes too and food and etc and i say that because when you get out here on the road especially if you pack light and you should be packing light you should only have like another outfit on you and that's it you know you have the outfit you're wearing and the outfit that's in the bag and that's it and the longer and longer you hitchhike the more you'll see why because the less and less you have to pack the better so i usually went with an extra outlet or outfit that's in my backpack and a sleeping bag and that was it that's all i carried in the backpack well a pair of flip-flops i think for occasionally when I was at a pool or a beach or something, I'd have flip-flops on me. And uh, swim trunks, I think. But that's the majority of what all I ever packed with me. And I did so with the understanding of I would either do laundry once a week or I would go to Walmart and you can buy the $3 or $6 t-shirts at Walmart that are in the, what you call it, low, not layaway, what the hell is the name of it? The ones that they're the shirts that they're trying to get rid of low clearance aisle or something like that and anyway you go there and usually a lot of times the t-shirts are only like three bucks or, or six bucks or something for a brand new t-shirt so for what would have been the cost of laundry six bucks worth to wash your laundry you have a shirt you know so in my opinion throw the dirty, dirty shirt away wear the brand new one you know and that's how i would get by on not you know because i wanted to say newer looking shirts and stuff like that Mostly the t-shirt. I did that with the t-shirts just so... Because that's the main thing that people look at is what you're wearing on your t-shirt. So I would buy whatever low clearance thing they had that was good good enough looking. Generic clothes. And that's the way I would do it. Or else occasionally you come along a uh, laundromat, you know, for six bucks or so. Average laundromat's about six bucks by the time you wash and dry and everything. Give or take. Sometimes ten bucks depending on the laundromat. But you take your, you know, every time you walk by a laundry mat, you should take the advantage of doing that and or a truck stop has laundry too. And wash your clothes if you have the money to do so because you never know when the next laundry mat is. And the other thing I have to say about thrift stores is if you walk by a secondhand store or a thrift store or a homeless shelter or something like that, go in there and ask them for clothes. Be like, I'm a hitchhiker. I don't have much money on me. Can you set me up with something? And they'll give you free clothes that you can use for whatever day or two or week or whatever you want to do. And it was free to get that. And that way you can keep your clothes up to date, so to speak, or keep yourself cleaner without having to cut, uh, spend money on it to do it. And occasionally you'll find these secondhand stores that are right off the interstate, which will help you out. And that is also what that 211 line I was talking about would help you with too, is find clothes. 
Uh, like I said at the beginning of this video, don't come out here with any warrants or warrants or anything that could end up turning into a warrant, like not paying a speeding ticket or something like that, because odds are pretty damn good. I mean, I have not met a hitchhiker yet that has not had to deal with cops. Because nowadays, they try their hardest and their best to try to keep you from hitchhiking. But it's not illegal, so there's not all that much they can do about it. And the majority of the time, they check to see if you're wanted or not on the ID. And th in exchange for doing that, and finding out that you're not, whatever, they'll take you to the next interstate exit. Or they might take you across the county, if they're going that way, if they're a county unit. And the majority of the time, they do that for a couple reasons. But they do it mainly so that, that you are no longer their problem. If, you're, if they're going east, if you're going east... And they know they have, you know, X amount of road ahead of you. 10, 15 miles, whatever. And they know they're going to continue to get calls on you for you know, out there thumbing and flying the sign or doing whatever. In order to avoid that, they're going to give you a ride all the way to the end of the county because now you become somebody else's problem. Because once you enter the next county over, it ain't their problem anymore if somebody calls. And so the fastest, easiest way for them to get rid of hitchhikers, so to speak, is to give you the ride down the county. So a lot of times you'll get rides from cops for that reason. Because it makes their life easier and helps you out. And last thing I want to point out in this video, it's getting pretty long, is hitchhiking during COVID. I do not recommend it. Just because you are increasing the risk big time by getting into different vehicle, different people's vehicles during COVID. That's the reason why I quit PTI. Well, that and the temperature. It's nice and warmer and almost sweating to death here in, in Texas compared to up there in, in uh, Montana. It would be cold right now. There, 46 degrees at night here as the low is pretty much the high in Montana right now. And so temperature-wise, that's why I'm not up there. But then the other reason is because of COVID. You know, I didn't want to continue taking the railroad crews around when I heard that a couple different drivers got COVID and the railroad crew had COVID. And it, it's not worth my health risk. Especially when I'm living on unemployment right now, and I can get by with a hundred bucks a week, pretty much of unemployment. Why risk the health risk of catching COVID? I know mostly you can survive it, but why go through something like that with a flu-type symptoms and whatnot if you can avoid it? And that's why I say try not to come out here right now and hitchhike because you are increasing your risk of catching COVID. Now, if it don't matter to you, go right ahead and do it. But to me personally. I would stay away from it for until they come out with the vaccine and until 10% or more of the population has been vaccinated to where it nullifies it or something like that the doctors were saying so probably a year I mean six months to a year from now I you know until then I don't recommend it I mean if this van blows up I'm basically stuck doing it hitchhiking if I want to go anywhere because of the situation where I put myself at, and which I'm, which I'm okay with doing if I have to do it, but I would much rather prefer to, you know, continue to live in the van and baby the van, and then I have my own space away from people. And I've considered possibly picking people up as I drive by, and willing to take the risk a little bit right at the moment because those other hitchhikers are trying to do what I was trying to do a year ago, but they're now they're trying to do it with COVID, and I know. If, majority of people are not wanting to pick them up because of that because they don't want to take the risk either and i've considered picking people up but i haven't seen any yet to do to give them a ride anyway but i don't know for sure if i would or wouldn't give them a ride at the moment because of that you know i could give a hitchhiker a ride and then i would get covid from it potentially so i don't know if it's worth the risk right now while i live my life is i go into a truck stop or walmart or whatever where i have to go for food and i do wear the mask even though I don't think they help much when I go into those places and I go into truck stop to shower. But aside from that, I'm pretty much in my van all day long or next to it or whatever out here in the wide open away from people. And that's the way I've been living my life. Just to try to keep myself safer, to keep myself quarantined away from people. I truly believe that if you stay away from other people, that's the best and easiest way to, to avoid, you know, the, avoid spreading the virus. And of course, washing your hands. And, but I'm not all too sure the masks actually work. I think the masks are more about control. And, because the government had, if they come out with a scary thing like a virus, they had to tell you something to be able to say, oh, but we have it under control. Same thing as 9-11 with TSA. Oh, but we've made TSA now. So we have it under control. You can go back to flying now, because we have TSA. 
you know it's about that sense of security and control and that's all they want to do is cool the masses like that because if that wasn't the case they wouldn't make liquor stores essential no liquor stores are not essential you don't have to drink liquor to, to survive they just did so to keep the masses dumbed down you know and i'm not gonna get into that whole entire thing but this video's getting pretty long. It's like an hour and ten minutes is for a sub subscriber specifically. But if you were looking for any hitchhiking tips, um, that's what this video was for. That's everything I can think of on a list immediately. I don't think I did the video exactly the way I wanted to do it. I'm going to rewatch it here and see. And if it passes muster, so to speak, without having to edit it too much or anything, I'm just going to upload it. And I think... Call I listed everything I could think of in terms of hitchhiking. The most of it comes down to trusting your instincts. You know, that driver looks scary, don't get in with him. There's other always other, other rides. You know, and you may be desperate in some locations where you've been there for two or three days trying to get out and whatever car stops you're just going to get in with and that's a hard feeling to get by. But you've got to watch your instincts. Not to say that it's scary. It's not scary by any means. Because like I say, 9 out of the 10 times or more, I felt safe. There was a couple occasions where the driver wasn't very a good driver. And I was glad I made it out of there alive. There's a couple of occasions like that Jeffrey Dahmer guy that scared me into thinking that I was going to get chopped up into pieces. But the majority of the time, you got to remember that these people who pull over to help you are good in their heart you know they're trying to do the right thing the other thing i will mention is try not to get rides closer to sunset or especially you know try not to hitchhike at night unless you just can't take it anymore and start walking and hitchhiking you know try to avoid things that you don't have to do you know if it's turning dark and you know by the time you get into a car with someone it's going to be dark your better bet is to go find some place to camp that night and, and start again in the morning the other thing I will mention is get in the habit of going to sleep pretty much right at dark. That way you can get the most hours of sleep in the darkness that you can. And that will give you more energy to be able to walk all day long during the next day. And that way you can get up earlier and you can be out when the sun is up. Kind of deal and hitchhiking. And trying, you know, you gotta to take advantage of as many daylight hours as you can doing it. But I'm starting to sweat to death. That's the majority of the video that I can think of. If I think of something else, I'll post another video for it. I'm going to check this video out and then upload it. Like and subscribe. Leave comments. Hopefully I help some people out. Catch you in the flip. Peace. As I was sitting here watching the video, or re-watching the last part of this video, I thought about a few other things uh, from situations that happened to me hitchhiking. And so I'm going to add to the list a little bit of an add-on to this video. Um, when I was talking about cardboard and yoga mats, etc., like I did before, the other thing I learned out near Laughlin, Nevada, I think it was, it was like way out in the middle of nowhere, though. I came upon this town that had a church in it. It might have been Quartzsite, Arizona, I can't remember. Maybe you think it was Quartzsite. But it had a church uh, in it along the street, and I happened to notice a 8-foot-long welcome mat. Yeah, the welcome mat is dirty, but it provided uh, insulation. And the funny thing I learned when I rolled up in that welcome mat like a burrito was the weight... Of the, of the welcome mat itself pushed down on me and kept the cold air out from around me and I that was almost the best sleep of my life wrapped up in a church welcome mat you know eight foot long you know welcome mat you're supposed to what you call it brush your feet off with brush your shoes off with before you walk in and yeah it's dirty because it's that's what it's made for is that but you know when you have the choice of being dirty or being cold because it was in the desert, you know, even though it's quartzite, it was the desert. I chose being dirty over being cold. You know, even being dirty, you can always clean yourself up later. You know, it wasn't the greatest thing in the world to roll up in a dirty floor mat. But that floor mat itself, you know, if I could, if I could somehow get rid of, the, rid of the weight during the day and have the weight of have that floor mat at night, I would do that. I would just sleep on the floor mat at night and have my own floor mat that I bought from Walmart. But it's, they, they weigh too much to pack around every day. But... If you need, even in a car, if you need something to help weigh you down to wear your sleeping bag and then you buy a floor mat and go over top of it with a regular clean floor mat that you just bought from Walmart, put that in your car and it will weigh you down and it'll put the, it'll keep the cold, cold weather from going in if you had extreme cold. 
problems with it, you know, sleeping out someplace that had stream cold to it. You make use of a format in some of those places, you know, if you're someplace where it was just raining and you were wet, you know, that's not the preferred way of doing it, but if you're wet or something and that was going to make you cold for the night because your clothing and stuff was wet, I would recommend, you know, at least wrapping up in a floor mat and that would help you because of the weight of it. A couple other things I thought of when I went along is there's a couple spots in the desert out by Laughlin where I didn't get rides for a couple days and the way I, I was able to get a ride the one time was I took a bunch of empty Bud Light bottles and I spread them out around me and slept in front of a church knowing full well that it was Saturday night and gonna be Sunday morning and that church was gonna be open on Sunday morning. This isn't the best idea in the world. I wouldn't highly recommend it to people, but it was an idea I came up with at the time that actually worked, did work out. But I figured, and it's a little bit scary to fall asleep knowing that you're gonna get woke up by somebody. I mean, that, you know, unless you woke up at the buck crack of dawn, you're most likely gonna get woke up by the pastor and the congregation and everything. It's a little bit scary knowing that when you go to sleep. But once I got past that, you know, and fell asleep, and sure enough, in the morning, I woke, I got woke up to the pastor. And the reason why I did that was to make it look like I'd gotten drunk and, and basically drank and passed out right there in the parking lot of their church because I knew it would offend them. Not that I want to offend people, but I knew it would offend them and they would end up calling the cops and the cops would have no other option but to take me away from that area, which would get me the ride where I need to go the hell out of there. So that's what I thought would happen that or they would help that help me themselves because oh this guy needs help he must be an alcoholic you know I thought that that's the two ways that that could go sure enough in the morning I got woke up by the pastor and his wife and next congregation of four or five people and yada yada but the pastor basically said I had to get out of there and blah 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 and just as that just as that happened another person who was pulling off the road to go attend that church that morning which is a you know a religious person that went there got offended by the fact that how they were treating me and so he got so offended that he said you know what hop on in man and we'll go to vegas or wherever you know and i think that's where i was trying to go to was just outside of las vegas and he took me almost all the way into the suburb of vegas where i was trying to go and said god bless you and prayed over me and blah 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 and you know helped me to get there because he could not believe that god's people would act like that to somebody that was out there and then i even told him the story that i specifically put empty beer bottles that I didn't drink. I just went and gathered about 10 Bud Light bottles that I didn't drink that were down the street. Came up with that idea and, you know, hate to say it, technically speaking, wanted to offend them, but wanted to increase the chances that I would get out of there because people were not pulling over to help me when I was thumbing it. And you may have to come up with situations like that as you're hitchhiking. And I'm just throwing something out there that that might be a thing. And another old guy, hitchhiker told me a story a long time ago and I remembered it out in the middle of nowhere and that helped me out too is whenever people won't pick you up let's say it's been like a day worth of trying to hitchhike legitimately and get out of there what you could do is as somebody's walking by you could faint or pretend to faint or pass out and as you're walking and fall down they may they still may not help you but they will send emergency services out to you you know the firemen the cops whatever or other people might stop and if you get an, a, a crowd of people together like two or three people stopped and then the fire department showed up and the whole you know you make a big scene out of it somebody in that whole entire scene is going to help you out now that they're face to face with you now that they're not driving by you so as you're hitchhiking if nothing else if you're in a hard place that you can't get out of you can fake having a health or medical condition fall down on the side of the road make it look like that wasn't your intention you know and you're just passed out and then you just play along with that story of, oh, I might need water, oh, I might need to be dehydrated, <laughs> or something like that, to get to where you're going, to the next interstate exit up, or wherever you need to go. I would not suggest doing that on a very busy road like an interstate, because people may or may not see you, and they might run you over if you're not you know, off the interstate enough. But, you know, on a back road, county highway kind of thing, you could get away with doing that. It's not the greatest thing in the world, again, because somebody you are risking, that somebody could accidentally drive over you and not see you. You know, I wouldn't fall down in the roadway itself or, you know, on, along the shoulder where it's safer, but still, somebody could run over you, so you got to keep an eye on that, you know. Don't just close your eyes and pray. You know, you got to be kind of look through your eyes a little bit, but pretend like you're out and make sure for your own safety that somebody don't try to, you know, accidentally try to drive over you. Because it could happen, you know, got to keep that safety, that amount of safety in mind when you go out hitchhiking. But 
I just thought I would add to it and so forth. That's what I've seen in my video as I'm watching it, re-watching it to upload it. So I might get another little bit more add-ons after this. That'll add on to the end of the video, I'm not sure. So, so far this video is an hour and probably about 15 minutes long. So it might be too much of my soapbox, I don't know, but we'll see. There might be more of an add to the clip of this video, there may not. If not, see you next time. If so, I'll see you in a second.